It is empty. Can you all see it? You know what it is, right? Ah, um, so I had this idea this week, and I thought, um, I need a casket in the church. And uh, so I started calling funeral homes. That's the weirdest call I've ever in my life made. And uh, many of them agreed with me that that was a weird call. And I finally was able to secure a, a casket from um, this Weitzel funeral home down on River Road, so I want to give them a hat tip and thank them. Um, and then I, I got it in my truck and, and brought it here. And um, I didn't really think about the logistics of getting a casket out of my truck in the parking lot. <laughs> and uh, next door there's a hair salon, and, and the average age of people who get their hair cut over there is like... Um, 65 year old lady, right? And uh, and their husbands often wait in the parking lot. So we, Sherry and I, waited until there was no one in the, until we thought there was no one in the parking lot, and we pulled this thing out and we're wheeling it in, and we saw a guy in the parking lot going, which pretty much guarantees he's never coming to church here. So yeah, well I'm gonna talk to you just a little bit. Uh, I'll get, tell you about this a little bit later, but um. You know, for a while now, I've wanted to talk about and explore this idea of wisdom. And I thought, what a great way to start Easter, to kick off this teaching series on Easter Sunday, uh, by talking about uh, wisdom. And so, um, I'm, I'm going to show you how, I want to show you how the risen Christ empowers us to live with wisdom. And so, you know, as, as we're preparing to, to teach this, I thought, you know, how do we, what are we going to call this series? I like to name each series. Um, and so we had some ideas. One was how not to be a fool. Um, that's not really engaging. And so then we thought about uh, five things wise people do. Um, and that sounds like, I don't know, it doesn't sound, sounds like something you buy on a bookshelf at Barnes & Noble. So I really wanted to talk about wisdom because the Bible talks a lot about foolishness and wisdom. The, the fool and the wise person. It talks a lot about this compare and contrast. And so just a couple notes. One of the things I want to make clear about is that uh, when we talk about wisdom, wisdom does not necessarily come from experience. Because I know lots of people who are old and foolish. Do you? I know lots of people who have lots and lots of experience who I would not put in the category of wise. And, and, and I think then I about... Uh, I, I know some people who are fairly young, and, and when they begin to speak, you're like, wow, you want to lean in because they have wisdom. And then I think about wisdom, and, and, and it, it occurs to me that wisdom does not necessarily come from yourself, right? It doesn't come from the inside, because I know lots of people who spend lots of time alone who are not necessarily wise. As we look through Scripture and as we evaluate experience, one of the things we see is that wisdom typically comes from some place and someone other than yourself. It comes from an outside source, a person, an experience, something that's coming from the outside, something other than yourself. And so as we're evaluating this, we think about this, wise people do wise things. And so for the next several weeks, we're going to look at the wise things that wise people do. And basically we're, we're making this, this premise. As we begin to look through the scriptures, we're going to make this, this claim. Do this, otherwise you may play the fool. Embrace this behavior. Think what this thought pattern. Otherwise, you may be a fool. Now, let me, let me give you a working definition and of, of what we're talking about when we say a fool. And I got this, uh, this definition in its seed form from Nicola Machiavelli. And um, I know that's a bit of a weird place for a church to draw inspiration from, but uh, let, me, let me tell you what he said. I, I basically edited what he said, because this is the kind of a working thought I want to use throughout the series. This is what he said. He said, a wise person does quickly what a fool does eventually. A wise person does quickly what a fool does Eventually, now let me let me kind of make the point here and demonstrate how this works. Think about your body, right? A wise person takes care of their body. They they eat well, they exercise well, they rest well. 
They care well for their body. Someone who may not be so wise does not pay attention, they eat whatever they want, they never exercise, they don't rest, until they have a heart attack. And then they begin to pay attention to their body. A wise person does quickly what a fool does eventually. Now some of you are like, I hate you already, Peterson. Listen, I don't mean it's not personal. But, but I just would ask, like, like, what are you waiting for, a heart attack, right? Because at some point in our lives, if we don't pay attention to our body, Quickly, we will eventually, maybe when it's a doctor standing over us at a bedside saying, man, you've got to change the way you're eating. You've got to change the way you're exercising. You've got to change your work habits. You've got to change it. A wise person would have addressed that a long time ago. How about money? <coughs> a wise person budgets. They spend less than what they make. They have a plan for their money. They save. They prepare for the future. You know what a fool does? They spend everything they have, and when they have nothing left, they pull out city card. And they go into debt. Now, a wise person, when, when, they're, when it's time to retire, they are prepared to retire. Because they actually have prepared, and they've saved, and, and that's wisdom. The fool gets to retirement and says, holy crap, I'm not ready at all for this. Right? And so at some point... The wise person has done quickly what the fool will realize, oh man, I should have paid attention to that. A wise person does quickly what a fool does eventually. How about, let me give you one more. Marriage. A wise person invests in his or her marriage. They pay attention to their spouse. They care for them. They love them. They communicate consistently. They nurture them. They learn their love language and pay attention to it and speak it. They invest heavily in their spouse. The marriage as well. A fool, on the other hand, works way too many hours, ignores his or her spouse, uses harsh words, gives them what's left over of their time, which is not much, and then one day they're served divorce papers and they're like, holy crap, I've got to get serious about my marriage. Right? A wise person does quickly what a fool does eventually. See, every point, at every point along the way, all of us are going to reach a point where we're going to say, I should have paid attention to my body, I should have paid attention to my finances, I should have paid attention to my relationships. And that principle applies spiritually as well. So Jesus told this incredible story, and um, he was at the time that he told it, he was actually surrounded by lots of people. Um, Luke, his biographer that told the story, said there were thousands of people who were milling around. They were in Jerusalem, and, and there's a big feast going on, and, and so all kinds of people were crowding around Jesus because he was kind of famous in that era, in that culture. And so they were gathered around, and, and one of the people yelled out to Jesus. They said, hey, preacher, tell my brother to divide the fa our father's estate with me. Tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Now, apparently, dad had died. He left this estate to the kids. There was some squabbling going on, and they're like, man, if we can just get to Jesus, maybe he'll say a wise word to this fool brother of mine, and he'll divide the estate. So he yells out. Jesus says to him, listen, um, this is in Luke chapter 12. He says, look, I'm not a judge over you to decide matters like this. And then he said this, beware, guard against every kind of greed. And life is not measured by how much you own. Life is not measured by how much you own. And then after making that interesting statement, he launches into this story. In Luke chapter 12. Beginning verse 16, he said, you know, there was a rich man. And every time Jesus, Jesus was like the Abraham Lincoln of the Jewish culture. When he would tell a story, people would lean in and they would listen because he was an incredible storyteller. He said, there was a rich man. And his crops, his fields were doing incredibly well. And he was having an incredible season of growth. The stock market was up. People were loving his, his wares. And, and he was doing so well that all of his barns were filled up with goods, and all of his barns were filled up with produce, and, and all of his accounts were full, and, and his house was full of stuff. And as he began to assess the situation, he said, man, there's still more stuff to be, there's still more crops to be picked, there's still more stuff to be had, and, and my barns are full. My, my storage units are full. My accounts are full. What am I going to do? So he said this. He said, I know what I'll do. I'm going to tear down my barn to build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and all my other goods. And then 
when I've filled up everything that I own, then I'm going to sit back and say to myself, friend, you've done well. Enjoy now what you have. Eat, drink, and be merry. Look at everything that you have. Jesus is telling the story, and he said, when that happened, God said, you fool. You will die this very night. Then who's going to get everything that you worked for? And then Jesus said this, and this is where I want to camp out right now. Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. A person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Now, let me just right off the bat say this very, very clearly. He did not say that a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth. In fact, if you read through scriptures, one of the things that you'll see is that wise people do save up wealth, and they do prepare for the future. It, the Bible is filled with counsel on how we ought to prepare for the future. The scriptures say that they're not saying in any way that it's bad or foolish to store up wealth. What Jesus is very clearly saying is that the person who builds up and saves and stores and, and builds and creates but doesn't have a rich relationship with God, that person is a fool. Jesus is essentially saying, look, if you do all this work, you build all this stuff, you fill up your house, you fill up your account, you've got the coolest shoes, you've got the best phone, your car's the envy of everyone on the block, you've got all this stuff, but if you don't have God in your life, you're a fool. So in our culture, um, we aren't building barns much these days. You know, I mean, maybe a couple people in this room have a barn, but most of us don't have barns. But what we do have is we have garages, right? And our garages are so full that some of us can't even park our cars in there, right? And so what do we do? Here's what we did. We, we empty out our garage like we just did this last year. We emptied out our garage and we take stuff to Goodwill and we're like, man, space. But then what do we do? We fill it back up. And so this time we're like, well, here's what I'm going to do. Rather than taking all the good oil, I'm going to have a yard sale. I'll make a little money, right? So we have a yard sale. We get rid of some stuff, and then we fill it back up. And we like, man, I see how this pattern's working. It's not going to go good. So we go, and we get a storage unit. Oh, well, we see all the storage units going up on 70s? That's great. Anyways. And we fill, and we fill, and we fill. I mean, we've got... We've got all kinds of, we've got phones and clothes and cars and tools and memberships and homes. We furnish rooms we don't use. We build decks we don't sit on. We take vacations that don't rest our soul. We post pictures of our experiences. We talk about our stuff. We're really good at collecting. We're really good at building. We're really good at storing. And yet, the question is this. This is just a bottom line, straight up the pipe question. How is your relationship with God? We've all got lots of stuff. Probably a lot of people got something new for Easter, and there's nothing wrong with that, nothing at all. But the question, the most fundamental question is, how is your relationship with God? I mean, does it exist? Do you have one? Is it poverty level? Maybe at some point you said, you know, I'm in. I'm, I'm connecting to God. I, I believe in Christ. And then, you know, it, uh, it kind of hit dry times, and you would describe your relationship with God as a poverty level relationship. Jesus said, if you don't have a rich relationship with God, you're playing the fool. So remember this. A wise person does quickly what a fool does eventually. There is, the truth is this. Someday, you will reach out to God. Someday, you will want God in your life. Someday, you will call for God in your life. Just like someday you're going to look and, 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 and wish that you had cared for your body or be glad that you had cared for your body. You're going to wish that you had cared for your finances or be glad that you have cared for your finances. You're going to wish that you had worked harder on your marriage or be glad that you worked hard on your marriage. Someday you're going to be in this position where you're going to wish that you had invested deeply in your relationship with God or you're going to be glad that you have invested deeply in your relationship with God. But the truth is a wise person does quickly – what a fool does eventually. Sherry and I are riding down the road Friday, and she said something to me that just stuck. It just grabbed the hold of my heart. She said, 
On Friday, you know, as Christians, we recognize Friday as the day that Jesus went to the cross. He was crucified for us. He died for our sins. And she said, Jesus went through a lot for us today. He went through a lot for us today. I don't think that I've ever really felt what I felt in that moment. When I began to think about the day of suffering that Christ experienced for us. To connect us to God. I, you know, the, the truth is, and this is why our church exists, is to help people discover God who absolutely loves you. Absolutely loves you. Now, anybody ever play Monopoly? Right? Everybody play Monopoly? Like, does anybody just hate Monopoly? <laughs> Not a good cheat. I, I absolutely hate Monopoly. And the reason is my wife... Um, because she's a legalist. And when we play, like, she always wins, but she insists that we play until every dollar is, is in her bank account. <laughs> like, I'm at some point, I'm like, babe, you realize I can't, I own no property, and I have, like, you're going to win in an hour. Why not just call it a game now, right? No, we gotta play the whole stupid game. So, I'm not a big fan of Monopoly. <laughs> But before I met Sherry, I, I would play Monopoly more and, and liked it a little more. <laughs> and and I, I, was, I would play and I would play to win. And here's what I realized about Monopoly. You play this game, right? You play for hours and you build houses and you accumulate hotels and you stack up cash. And at the end of the game, what happens? It all goes back in the box. All your houses, all your hotels, that cool little car, right? The cash, it all goes back in the box. And I thought, you know, life is actually a lot like Monopoly. We will spend hours and hours and days and weeks and months and years and decades building and storing and creating and saving, and then we die. And you know what happens? It all goes back in the box. Listen, I've done a lot of funerals. You've heard that old saying that um, he who has the most toys wins. You've heard that? You've heard that? Nope. I've done a lot of funerals, and I've never seen toys at the funeral. There's just a box. Just a box. That's it. It doesn't matter how many toys you had. It didn't matter how big your bank account was. It didn't matter uh, how many titles you had or trophies you had. It didn't matter how many pairs of shoes you had. It didn't matter what kind of car you had. It all goes back in the box. The scriptures beat this drum over and over and over. Let me just give you a couple. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 15, written by a very wealthy man, Solomon. He says this, We all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty-handed as on the day we were born. We can't take our riches with us. You came into this world naked, screaming, being touched by all kinds of people. That's how you go out. You're naked, you're being touched by all kinds of people who've never seen you before, but you don't care because you don't know you're not there, right? We leave just like we came with nothing. So there's this great verse in, in, in Psalms. David is reflecting a little bit, and he's giving some counsel to, to people like us who struggle with things like this. And he, he says in Psalms 49, uh, verses 16 through 20, he says, look, don't be dismayed. When the wicked grow rich and their homes become ever more splendid, for when they die, they take nothing with them. So, I mean, the truth is sometimes we'll look around and, and we'll see, you know, we'll see politicians, we see actors, we see athletes, we see, you know, whatever. We, people who are just, they're, they're, they're dishonest, they're abusive, they're, they're crooked, they're all these things. We're like, my God, but look at the car they drive. Look at the house they live in. They're not struggling like me financially. Look at them. And David says, yeah, but the truth is they don't get to take it with them when they die. Their wealth, he said, will not follow them into the grave. 
In this life, they consider themselves fortunate and are applauded for their success. And there's some truth to that. They are. People are like, wow, you've done really well. Nice car, nice house, nice bank account, nice position, nice life. He said, but they will all die like all before them and never again see the light of day. And then he says this, and this is really amazing. He says, people who boast of their wealth don't understand. They will die just like animals. And I think about this, and I think there have been some incredibly wealthy, powerful people um, who have been famous, who have died. And, um, and then I think about this. I'm a father of six children, and we've had a lot of pets. And in our backyard, we've got a cemetery that consists of guinea pigs. And fish, and uh, they died just like those rich, famous people who had everything. And David in this psalm says, Look, listen, the people that we're looking at and envying, the things that we're trying to become, the, all the stuff that we're trying to accumulate, someday at the end of the game, it all goes in the box, and that's it. Everyone's in the box, that's it. The wealthiest, the most powerful, the most influential, they die just like your guinea pig. They die just like your fish. They die just like your snake. They die just like your puppy. That last one hurt a little bit, sorry. <laughs> Iguana, right? Nobody cares if iguanas die. But at the end of the day, it all goes back <coughs> to box. And if all you have is wealth, You've missed the most important thing. Jesus said, listen, if you build all this wealth and you don't have a rich relationship with God, oh, you're a fool. Because when you're here, the only thing that matters is your connection to God. Now listen, someday every single person faces God. They have some things to say to God. And a wise person does quickly what a fool does eventually. Listen, as a pastor, I have this awesome honor of being a part of people's lives at pretty critical points. When, when kids are born, when marriages happen, and then oftentimes when funerals happen. And I've got to see friends. I've got to see people that I love. I've got to see people that I know. I've got to see them live their life. And then had the honor of standing behind their casket and presiding at their funeral. I don't mean to be morbid, but the truth is every day, or every one of us will someday be in this box. And the question then is this. What matters? How much stuff or who we know? Jesus said, listen, if you spend your whole life and you accumulate, 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 but you don't know God, it's the most foolish thing you can do. And so for Christians, the biggest, the biggest point of hope that we have is that Jesus Christ came into this world. He became a person like you and me. And he went to the cross and he took the punishment for all of our sins. And now he says to us, if you will believe in me, if you will trust in me, you can have a relationship with God. He will become your father. And then you can have all the stuff you want. You can build, you can save, you can create, but you have the most important thing. You've got a relationship with God. And when everything goes back in the box, and when you're laid out here, you have the one thing that counts more than anything. Now this is the starting point of wisdom. As we begin this conversation about wisdom over the next several weeks, it all starts here. Connection to God made available to you, made available to me by the resurrected Christ. And that's why Christians are so optimistic. Because we have, through Christ, everything that we need made available to us. Life, love, wisdom, vision, courage, hope, transformation. It's ours through Christ. And any person can have it. 
who moves towards Christ and believes in him. And so listen, here's what we want to do today, just to start all this off. I'm just going to pray. And then our, our worship team is going to come. And we're going to uh, just take a couple moments just to quietly reflect on what Christ has done for us and offer us a dedication.